Welcome everyone to this bonus episode of Turning to the Mystics, where we're turning to our very own Jim Finley to guide us into this Advent season. And before I hand over to Jim, I just wanted to let everyone know that we're here recording this, this podcast as part of a live virtual gathering. And after Jim's talk, people who are with us today are going to be asking Jim some questions. So we're very excited. Um, so Jim, welcome. Yes, thank you. So glad to be here together like this. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, I'll, I'll introduce this uh, reflection here with you uh, by saying that I, I, I first started writing these reflections about this particular set of reflections about 10 years ago on how to live a more contemplative way of life in the midst of the world. And seeing the one way to do this is, is to offer a series of reflections on the mystical dimensions of discipleship. That is to take a saying of Jesus or a gesture of Jesus and seeing it as a path of clarity or awareness that we can internalize to become more aware of God's oneness uh, in our lives. And so this is offered in, in the context of this kind of mystical gospel series of reflections. I want to say also at the beginning that this is, this is poetic. And, um, and, and so it's, it's not academic at all, but there is a kind of an intuitive uh, density to it, which is why by having it archived, if you care to go back and listen to it and sit with it, uh, hopefully it'll help you in your own spiritual journey. And so with that, then I'll begin with this meditation. <clears throat> On childlike acceptance is the path to heaven. And our text is um, Jesus saying to us, unless you accept the kingdom of God as a small child, you shall not enter it. I'll begin with a, with a, with a sharing a, an, an event, an experience that I had. Years ago, I was... Um, uh, on a plane of uh, flying somewhere to uh, lead a silent contemplative retreat. And I was sitting in the aisle seat and uh, I had my Sermons of Meister Eckhart open or Teresa of Avila, whatever it was. I had my fountain pen out and I was working on my talks. And sitting next to me in the, in the middle seat was a woman reading a magazine. And sitting in the window seat was her little boy. Maybe he was four. I think he was little. And um, the little boy was looking out the window. He said over his shoulder to his mother, he said, Mommy, does the man driving the plane know where Grandma lives? As you could sense, he was trying to take all this in. And uh, the mother said to her little boy, without looking up from her magazine, she said, uh, close enough. And I thought, you know, that's a pretty clever answer. Because if Grandma lives in the greater Chicago area, the Chicago air airport to where the plane was headed is close enough. But her, her child was too little to appreciate the cleverness of her answer. The child just accepted it. And then a moment later, something really amazing happened. The mother turned and looked at the back of her child's head. She closed her magazine and she leaned over, put her face up next to his and joined him in looking out the window. It was such a little thing, really, so subtle. There was no announcement over the speaker system congratulating the woman and her little boy. Very subtle. But, um, in realizing that her close enough answer wasn't nearly good enough, that she and her child both deserved better. And she was drawn by his acceptance to join him in the child's acceptance. And together, I sense that interiorly, even before they arrived at her mother's house, his grandmother, um, as she was uh, in the midst of a homecoming, drawing closer to her origin. And I could also feel within myself, as I continued writing, I could feel myself interiorly like leaning in with her 
kind of drawn um, by the by the awakening energies of this subtle kind of uh, sacred moment. And uh, we we all we're all we're all familiar with this. That is, uh, we we all know what it's like to be um, to experience that our defenses are being breached by the unguarded acceptance of a small child. And uh, we, we draw in closer, like there's something wondrous about it, a, a source of a, a kind of awakening delight in it. Now this, this insight that there's something about the child, uh, childlike acceptance, the acceptance of small children, that has a certain inner richness to, to life itself, this insight is, is, an, is an ancient one. 2,000 years ago or so, uh, in the Gospels, there's a scene where, uh, the way I visualize it, Jesus is sitting there teaching. And um, uh, Jesus, um, uh, the people are sitting there all gathered about him. And uh, he, he, he looks down and sees a child standing there at his knee. And he looks down into the child's upturned face as into a deep well of acceptance. And he picks the child up, holds the child on his lap, looks out and says to all the people there and to us, the deathless presence of Jesus says it to us, then I say to you, unless you accept the kingdom of God as a small child, you shall not enter it. Quite a statement. So. Now, in order to appreciate the, the meaning of this saying of Jesus, its relevance to us, we need to have some understanding of what Jesus meant by the, by the kingdom of God. That Jesus, uh, theologically for us, is the Christ. That whatever it means to be God, and whatever it means to be human, is woven together into a single unit of mystery. Another way of looking at it <clears throat> is that Jesus was a Jewish mystic. And uh, was a mystic teacher. And like all mystic teachers, he was always looking for ways to awaken us to the all-pervasive presence of God that is life itself. And so he sees the child, holds a child on his lap as an awakening moment. Unless you accept the kingdom of God as a small child, you shall not enter it. And so we need to understand then what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God. In some passages, Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God as an eschatological fulfillment, the second coming, the end of time. That is, it's, it's the ultimate victory of God's love over all forms of suffering and death, where the lion shall lie down with the lamb and God wipes every tear from our eye. And so we have to have a certain kind of childlike sincerity to sense the truth of the, of the mythic richness of this uh, ultimate consummation of love. In other passages, Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God as something that we should work for the kingdom of God. That is, we, just, we don't just passively wait for this fulfillment to come beyond the veil of death uh, at the end of time, but we're to bear witness to it through Christ-like love for ourself, for others, for the earth, for each other, and so on. And so we're to bear witness through love, preparing the way for the, for the kingdom, uh, for uh, honoring and walking with this love dimension uh, of day by day living. Discipleship, the moral imperative, and so on. And so other passages, Jesus speaks uh, the, of the kingdom of God it's a mystery that's already here. The kingdom of heaven is within you, Jesus says. And, um, and this is what most concerns us here in, in this contemplative mystical dimensions of daily life and discipleship. Um, that somehow the kingdom of God, that is God's ultimate victory over all forms of suffering and death, which is the very presence of God, is already upon us. 
and is already the deep down reality of all that we are, of, of the reality of everything. And, um, and, and so the, and the way to realize this, which would be the end of sorrow, would be to realize that fear has no foundations. But the way to realize this is to accept it, that it's true, and to accept it as a small child ex accepts it. And so this is what we're reflecting on here. How do we kind of, uh, kind of intuitively or experientially begin to uh, turn towards these sensibilities or these sensitivities of this vision, this intuitive understanding? Uh, the hidden heart of everything, the hidden heart of our life. And one way to get at this for all the, the Christian mystical tradition, and each world religion has its own language for this, so here in the Christian tradition, Judeo-Christian, Islamic tradition of Abraham, God, is creation. Is creation, the first, the opening words of Torah, and that in the beginning, God said, so that in the beginning, we hear God speaking light into being. See, let there be light, let there be stones and trees and stars. So in the beginning, uh, God is speaking all things all into existence. And this, this word of God speaking all things into existence is absolute and perpetual. It's, it's the immediacy of every moment of our life. This very moment we're sitting here now being spoken by God into this moment of being here now together, along with the whole earth, the universe, everything. Let's see things like this. So we might put it this way, we're looking for poetic metaphors now to kind of bear witness to this vision. You know, we might say that God's let there be light, God's let it be, is God's big bang. That is, in let there, God's let there be light, God serenely explodes into and as light it, see let, let there be let there be trees god's in god's let there be trees and stones and stars god serenely explodes into and as stones and trees and stars and uh, of all things and, and so um we, we we see then that uh to pay close attention to anything is to discover directly for ourselves that the little things of our daily life is the holy ground of God's kingdom. In God, we live and move and have our being. We're living our life in the interior, vast interiority of God, concretized as the immediacy of our life, the world, the sun moving across the sky. It's having this kind of poetic, uh, faith-illumined way of understanding the nature of our situation. Now, when we read the Gospels, we see that this is how Jesus lived, the seeing. Because Jesus, his mind was clear, you know, it was lucid. He saw so clearly. And Jesus says to us, uh, because Jesus saw God in all that he saw. And what's really extraordinary about it, it didn't matter whether Jesus was looking at his own mother or a prostitute. It didn't matter whether he was looking at a, at a bird or a, or a tree. It didn't matter he was looking at a poor widow dropping her last coin in the box or a person of great power. It didn't matter whether he was looking at his disciples or his executioners. Jesus saw God in all that he saw. And Jesus said, you have eyes to see and you do not see. That is, there is your God-given capacity to see your God-given nature and your nothingness without God, and you don't see it. This is the source of all your sorrow, the source of all your confusion. And so our prayer is, Lord, that I might see, that I might see through my own eyes what you saw and see in everything that you see, that I might see you in everything that I see. And so how do we do this? How do we do that? How do we do this? And Jesus says in the light of this text here, how we do it is by accepting that it's already true and accepting that it's already true as a small child accepts. And so this image I have then, the deathless presence of Jesus, is Jesus is sitting there with the child on his lap like an icon, a 
like a timeless icon, and they're both looking right at us, saying this to us with the child. If, if you accept this kingdom, that is the kingdom nature, the immediacy of all things, as a small child accepts, you will find yourself in the intimate realization of the truth of this. It's awakened clarity to be someone who's awakened. Another uh, the Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, he puts it this way, looking at this, this bearing witness to this vision and how to live by it. Uh, one of his sermons, Meister Eckhart says, for God to be is to give being, and for us and all things to be is to receive being. And he says the giving, that is, the, the, the giving of being is not the act that God performs, it's the act that God is. He understands, God, that the generosity of the infinite is infinite. And the generosity of God is that God generously gives the infinity of God away, whole and complete, in and as the, the, the intimate immediacy of the very reality of all things. And the receiving for us to be is to receive being. This receiving of being is not the act that all things are performing. It's the act that all things are. It's the act that we are. There's, there's an ontological, immediate receiving of the immediacy of the infinite giving. So there's a kind of an intertwining or a, a unitive mystery that lies at the heart of, 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 of everything real. See, this, this oneness that is it's kind of the ontological truth or the true nature of all things. And if we look at it this way, then, see, we might say then that uh, we realize that uh, we become aware that these, this vision is beautiful, but there's also something elusive about it. There's something, when we hear it, we can sense the beauty or the depth of it, beauty of it. And he says, the way to bring it into focus is to accept that it's true as a child accepts that it's true. So here then is a path. I want to suggest this as a, as a kind of a meditative uh, way to be in your own home this way. Is to go home, sit still, a close reverential attention to each little breath you take. Observe with unhurried attentiveness the thoughts and feelings that arise and fall away within you. Walk around. Look at all the familiar things that surround you every day. Accept as a small child accepts that your own living room, your own bedroom, is God's manifested presence in the world. Accept as a small child accepts that the way a bush by your front door has bloomed this year more than ever before, or the way it is unexplainably dying and you don't have time to do anything about it, is manifesting the mystery of God, given whole and complete in the coming to be in the passing away of all things. Except as a small child accepts that all the little things that make up your daily life from the terrain of God's kingdom, the place where God reigns with endless love and delight, Know and trust that as you learn to establish yourself in a stance of childlike acceptance, that God is present in your life, and you can learn to experience that presence in ever more habitual, ever more radicalizing and deeper ways, and then share that with others day by day. Yes. So then the question is, but how then... Are, if this is achieved through this childlike acceptance, then it requires that we become students of, of childlike acceptance. That is, we have to seek to understand as adults, we have to ponder or contemplate or reflect on the nature of childlike acceptance. And so what is the childlike acceptance? In what ways does it differ from our acceptance as adults, which is real and important? We'll get at this later. But how does that differ than the, the, the childlike acceptance through which we enter 
into the celestial nature of every moment of our life. Yes. One observation is that children, the childlike acceptance is not a matter of the will. That is, they don't accept because they're trying to accept. But when a mother presents her breast to her infant, it drinks without hesitation. The infant immediately accepts what is offered without question. Children simply accept what comes their way. This is not to say that we don't have to try to accept that God is unexplainably present in each breath and heartbeat, as Merton says, coursing through our very veins whether we want it to or not in the moment. It doesn't mean we don't have to try, especially in troubled times and suffering and hardship. We do need to try. But we're saying that as long as our acceptance is the result of our effort to accept, it's not yet the acceptance that wakens, that is the mystical quickening this realization of the divinity of the immediacy of things. Likewise, notice that the acceptance of small children is not the result of, uh, of having carefully reflected upon the matter and thought it through. As they thought it through, they carefully considered things and they sat with scripture texts and theological treaties and reflected and, and therefore they came to the conclusion this. Um, uh, and therefore, it doesn't mean that we don't have to try to, to understand this in order to accept it. And Augustine says, believe in order to understand. Because we do. We have to pray the scriptures or sit with the teaching of the saints and mystics and poets. We have to reflect and ponder on it and say, based upon careful consideration, I, 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 I stand in the truth of what's said here. It's just that as long as our acceptance that God's already perfectly present in the sacred nature of the immediacy of all things, as long as that's based upon the conclusion that I've arrived at, that acceptance through that reflective thinking process is not yet the acceptance of a, of a child. Because the thing about children is it isn't that they're trying to accept. But the thing about children, our children are acts of acceptance in our midst. In other words, I think what really uh, touches us about children is that ontological sense of God being poured out in the act of giving God away as our very being receiving it in our nothingness without God. We, we sense that immediacy shining out in their presence, and that's why it touches us so. That's why we know to, reading a small child a good night story, you can tell in the presence of the child or in the presence of God. I think that's what's shining out for us this way. And so if children then touch us so the way they do, because they are acts of acceptance, that itself embodies God's generosity, which is the, the, the gift, how they gift our lives. Is it true then that the way for us to realize this is for us to become an act of acceptance in the world? Is this what Jesus is telling us? See, in order to accept as a small child accepts, see, that the fullness of God is already uh, unexplainably upon you, pouring itself out as every breath and heartbeat, is to accept it as a small child accepts, is to become an act of acceptance as an adult. But then we ask, well, uh, 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 how, how do we do that? See, it's like a, it's like a Buddha, it's like a, it's like a koan, or like a riddle, a, 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 a cipher. So we're presented with something we get the glimmer of something that we're powerless to grasp. We're put in the presence of a mystery that's so close, but it's so the immensity of it. That's how do I become 
an act of acceptance in my adult reflective mind like this. Now, what I think is helpful, and I think a lot of contemplative living with this, is uh, the experiential self-knowledge that comes in the careful pondering of our lives. And one of the things that we notice is that from time to time, we're graced with spontaneous quickenings of becoming an act of acceptance. This is what happened to the woman on the plane. See, she didn't sit there and figure something out. She didn't try to accept. But rather, she was quickened. And in that quickening, in some subtle way, she herself became an act of acceptance, one with her child's act of acceptance. And it, and it graced her so like this. And um, uh, uh, and so we can look for these these moments that come up on us in the realms of human existence. It can come up on us in, in the midst of nature. Thomas Merton talks about walking out somewhere and turning to see a flock of birds descending, and as if out of the corner of your eye, you sense in their descent something vast, primordial, and true. And in some way, the presence of the birds is the presence of God concretizing presence in the miracle of the birds, like this. Or sometimes it's in the arms of the beloved, in a kind of a mutual surrender to union, in being present to children, the pause between two lines of a poem, a quiet hour at day's end. But from time to time, we're graced with these fleeting moments of being an act of acceptance. It's, it's quiet and uh, wondrous unexplainably self-evident. It just, it's just the truth. And we rest in it. It's like momentarily resting in the presence of God, resting in us unexplainably in the simplicity of the moment. It happens. And um, here's the thing. These grace moments, the problem is they tend to be very brief and they tend to be very fleeting. But what can happen is the ego self that was transcended in the moment of intimately realized oneness can, having tasted it, feel a certain longing to abide in the depths so fleetingly glimpsed. See, in my most childlike hour, uh, I was granted a taste of the oneness that I know is the true nature of every moment of my life, and I will not play the cynic. See, I, I will not. I will not doubt my own awakened heart. This is, and so I long to abide in it. And, um, the, and so. Uh, this is where this is the challenge now of this. We're sitting with the beauty of this. We're sitting with the subtlety of it. We kind of sense this is not the way we're used to thinking as we go through the day. And we're kind of trying to follow this path and how we can be stabilized habitually in this awareness. And so the point is this if we're searching for this, I have this image, let's say you're driving along the highway and uh, you have this, if you're driving along real fast, if you're waiting for a big flashing sign pointing childlike acceptance, this off-ramp, you'll drive right past it. You have to be willing instead to slow down enough to see the little sign nailed to the trunk of a tree. Uh, you, you have to um, kind of slow down enough if you're out, say, walking the midst of nature to just walk and just be there and to let yourself linger at each little thing for as long as you're inclined to linger with the shape of a twig or the sound of the bird or the texture of the stone, whatever, and just quietly be there unhurriedly and being careful to not to think you're trying to push through and find something called childlike acceptance, but rather to let yourself slow down enough because we, we can't attain it but it attains us in our deep acceptance of our powerlessness to attain it, just quietly being there in that quietness with all our heart. Notice, this is how this talk is proceeding. 
Notice I'm not moving along sequ some sequential path, marking off at checkpoints of things, but we're trying to move very slowly in evocative poetic language, that the cadences of which bears witness to or causes a certain resonance with the presence of God embodied in these intimations. Another big challenge of this, then, is not to dismiss the awakenings. See, because when the moment passes, the ego self that was transcended in this moment is skeptical. Well, it was just a moment of fantasy, you know, a certain moment of emotional stirring or misfiring of synapses. We have to have faith that the truth of it is the truth, that we realize it to be in the moment it was actually occurring is this truth. And I carry the remembrance of it in my heart. Here's an image. Imagine a father picking his little girl up and setting her up in the low branches of a tree. And he reaches up his arms like this and says, jump, 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 I'll catch you. And the little girl with some trepidation is holding on and she's looking down. But by accepting that her father will catch her, she jumps. In the acceptance, he catches her, and they're laughing, and they spin around together in an acceptance once they pass together through the gate of heaven. A kind of, a, Eckhart would say, a joy without a cause, a kind of an abyss-like holy joy, so utterly childlike and disarming and true like this. There's a poet, Theodore Rothka. His poem used to be in The New Yorker. I haven't read The New Yorker for a while, back when I read The New Yorker. And Theodore Rotha's father was a cultivated hybrid roses. And there's a poem he writes of a memory of his father when he was a little boy with the roses, the Rocha, Theodore Rothka says. And I dream of roses white and red, and my father standing astride the cement benches, lifting me high over the six foot stems, the Mrs. Russells in his own elaborate hybrids. What need for heaven then in that man? And those roses. And the poet Longfellow said, you know, the child is father to the man. We might say the daughter is mother to the mother. For we might wonder if Rothka's father, in lifting his little boy over the six foot stems, was not being fathered by a small child's blissful acceptance into a state of a moment of heavenly joy. Well, we might wonder if Rothka, in writing this poem, was not fathered into paradise by this fond remembrance of himself as a little boy. We might wonder if, in reading the poem, we are not momentarily fathered, mothered, into a taste of heaven by the truth glimpsed in the poem's imagery. We might ask if this is not what poems are for, if this is not what life is for, if this is not what we are for, to be awakened and then to be instrumental in helping others to awaken to the celestial nature of the miracle of what it, of what it is to be. So here then is the practical question. We say, yes, this is beautiful. And yes, I've had my moments of tasting it directly for myself. But yes, it remains elusive. So how do I stabilize in it? And this is meditation practice. That, that, that a daily rendezvous with God in meditative prayer, contemplative prayer, is, is fidelity to a daily rendezvous in which there is no agenda, but to uh, be present to and receptively open to God. Um, accessing you and touching your heart uh, with this quickened awareness of God's unexplainable oneness with you that is your very life. So here then, uh, there is a kind of a lexio where we hear these, like these words are lexio, these words are words that access us. In the moment we're being accessed when this lexio state, the ladder to heaven, like we go, and then we're reflecting on it. Notice the second step to the ladder, we're reflecting on this together. And then there is a prayer. We started with the prayer of, from the heart. Help, ask God I, to help us with this. See. So how do we reach then this contemplative state 
this mystical state of stabilized oneness as is given to us to realize it. So here's a way to meditate that helps me. And I offer to you, see it might help you. If you're called to it, if you're inclined in your heart to do this or this spiritual direction, there's all different ways of doing this. Kind of it's like putting words to something that maybe you haven't even thought of in these terms. You know, uh, uh, tending the roses with a long, slow walk to no place in particular. Or sitting in the presence of someone in whose presence you're taken to the deeper place. The, um, the, the quiet hour, uh, empty-handed with no agenda, whatever, sitting. So here's a way to drop down into this state in a more stabilized way. is to sit in a quiet place. Sitting still, sitting straight. Renew your awareness that God's all about you and within you. As St. Augustine says, closer to you than you are to yourself. And as you're sitting there, uh, become aware of your breathing. Focus on the breathing. Notice that around you, uh, thoughts and memories and feelings are right. You're, you're aware of them, but you kind of, in your intention, you let it fall into the background and just stay focused upon your breathing. On, the, on each inhalation. Become focused on, the, on an inhalation, a kind of interior gazing of your body's acceptance of each inhalation, your body's acceptance of each inhalation, and God breathes into Adam the gift of life. So that when you inhale, God's exhaling God in a self-donating, giving act as a God-given, godly nature of the immediacy of your very life. And say, focus there on the breath in an unhurried, quiet way. See, it's so, so subtle. And if you're drawn to it, to stay there long enough until it begins to have its way with you. For some people, as they start 20 minutes is a practical time, when it's short enough to be practical, but it's long enough that you can begin to drop down in um, into the deeper place of this attentiveness. Uh, of their body's acceptance of each breath. And as you keep sitting there like that, like leaning into it, leaning into it, simply allow yourself or to realize that you yourself are becoming the body's acceptance, okay? which is the kingdom of God. Then notice as you sit there this way, observing, say, a thought arising, you see thoughts arising. The, you observe that the thought is arising. Try not to think about the thought that's arising. No matter how pleasant it is, don't cling to it. No matter how unpleasant, don't reject it. Just observe and accept the thought is arising. It is. Let, let, to let what is be. And notice that if the thought lingers, accept that it's lingering as long as it lingers. And as it passes away, accept that it's passing away. So too with feelings arise in you, a feeling of sadness or loneliness or confusion or peace or joy, emotion. And as it arises, just ex be aware that it's arising, accept that it's arising. If it lingers, accept that it lingers as it passes, passes away. And little by little by little, uh, keep leaning into it that through the grace of God, you become the act of acceptance of, the, of God's presence in the rising and the falling, a way of thoughts, feelings, memories, sensation, the divinization of the concreteness, the incomprehensible stature of the miracle of the immediacy of yourself in the present moment. Now, as a way to end here, we have to acknowledge also another important challenge. And that is that, that, that children, in their acceptance, they need us as adults to protect them. A small child will put their hand right into a flame. Or a child who can't swim will step into the deep end of a swimming pool. Or a child who can't swim will go off with a stranger who might do terrible things to them. And so they depend on us to, uh, to take care of them until they grow old enough to internalize those skills so they can take care of themselves in a precarious world. 
uh, that is fraught with hazards of all sorts. So we might say then about Jesus, that Jesus was a street smart person who knew by experience how risky life on this earth can sometimes be, led to his crucifixion. See? So Jesus says to us, see, be wise as a serpent and simple as a dove. To be wise as a serpent is not to be naive about the hazards of this world. To be wise as a serpent um, is for parents to watch over and protect their children to not go into the into the not go in, and so on. Just watch over them to be protecting them, like this, and be aware of it ourselves because you're in your situation. I'm in mine. We're, we're in the midst of things, some of which might not be real easy right now. Quite the contrary. Turn on the evening news. So, but not to become so serpent-like about the ways of the world, that you lose the sensitivity of becoming simple as a dove. To become simple as a dove see, is to know that regardless of how hazardous the hazards of the world might be, there is in the deep down truth of things, the invincible presence of God welling up and giving herself away unexplainably, permeating us through and through and through, regardless of the outcome of the situation. See, this is the peace of God that surpasses understanding because it's the peace of God that depends on nothing. The peace upon which all things depend. Like this. An old man feels a small child's hand slip into his own and suddenly he's touched to the core by something so incredibly beautiful about life that makes all its troubles more than worthwhile. <coughs> Here then is a spiritual path you can choose to follow. Choose, continue to be as careful as you can be and teach each small and teach small children in your care to do the same. Look both ways before crossing the street. Be sure the door is locked before going to bed. Take heed of the warnings contained in the phrase, the devil is in the details, which is to say there can be hell to pay in neglecting the rising up of things that little by little can whittle away and bring down the happiness of your life. If left untended to and watched over as best you can. But in and through all this vigilance, do your best to remain rooted in childlike acceptance of life as it comes, true to the providential flow of things, and trust that the point beyond your ability to control and figure out your life is the very point in which God is the sustaining refuge of your life. By following this path of childlike acceptance, you can learn to awaken to the grace and endlessly trustworthy mystery that runs like a river through all of life and death and beyond. By the way, this also means accepting your inability, the extent to which you cannot do this, because you're just a human being. But knowing that God infinitely accepts you as infinitely in love with you and the sincerity of your acceptance of your inabilities, which is poverty of spirit, which is, which is humility. The small children are there in our lives as reminders of this path that we as adults freely choose as an adult to surrender ourselves over, not to accept the world as a child, see, but to accept the kingdom of the child, that in the midst of this world, there's this rootedness, see, that God is the presence that protects us from nothing, even as God unexplainably sustains us in all things. And so here then is the grand finale, I guess, to this poetic exploration, is to realize the unthinkable and liberating truth that even if we burn to death, fire is trustworthy. That even if we drown, the water is trustworthy. 
Even if a stranger carries us off to do her terrible things to us, the stranger remains a deeply confused member of the essentially trustworthy member of the human family, the world that God so loved that he sent his only begotten son. And we, and we live by this as true spiritual maturity. And here's then as a final image. Imagine you're on a big boat and you're crossing a vast expanse of water. And there's a big party going on. There's music, people are dancing. And in a back, moment of carelessness, you fall off the back of the boat. And you're waving frantically and the music no one notices. And uh, the boat disappears into the horizon. You realize you can't tread water for very long, but you can float for a long, long time. And so uh, you lay back to float and uh, in order to float, you have to relax. And how would you relax there? You'd relax very seriously, which is the essence of meditation. Okay. And the water is rising and falling like this, rising and falling. You're out there looking up into the sky. The day goes by, night comes, the stars, there, are, there you are in the dark, rising and falling in the waves. In the morning, you see the sun come up. Like this as it comes up something dawns on you it like breaks over you it doesn't matter whether they come find you or you're drowned it's the same thing but if god is lord of life god is lord of death god's the infinity of life god's the infinity of death this is what makes life unexplainably trustworthy it's what makes death unexplainably trustworthy and it doesn't come to you as an idea it comes to you as an act of acceptance of the unbearable beauty and truth of it. You might start crying, you might burst out laughing, you might just be in wonder. And in that very moment, out of the corner of your eye, you see the boat coming back to get you. And you're so relieved, and when they pull you on board, you're crying and hugging them, and a long hot shower and a nice meal, and that night you're lying there in the little room there, in the little bed in the boat in the dark. You're so grateful that they came for you and saved your life. But in your heart, you know that in a deeper way, your life was saved out there in the midst of the sea in an infinite act of acceptance of the infinitely acceptable divinity of the unfolding of the immediacy of things like this. Okay. And so, yes, in this sense, it doesn't make any sense to the ego that fire is trustworthy because we're burning. But what is it in you if you burn to death, it doesn't burn because it's that in you that belongs completely to God being given to you. You know, it's the depth dimension of your soulful divinity and your nothingness without God and so on. So admittedly for us as an ego, this is a hard pill to swallow. The sense of acceptance is how Jesus died on the cross. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He handed himself over into the, into the trust of the God that he could no longer find. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like this. But if we take their medicine, it will make us well, because here's the price for not taking it. If we don't take this medicine of, of the divinity of acceptance, it means the only peace we're capable of having is that a peace that depends on our ability to maintain conditions conducive to peace. The only security is that security conditions that we maintain conditions security, but it doesn't lie in our power. To maintain those conditions as your life shows you not to mention your family or the world we don't have that power and therefore unless we're awakened this way our peace is a precarious peace a conditional peace in the fragility of the world's ways if we're surrendered over to this peace and grounded in this peace we can be present to the world and we can learn then this transformative artistry this gift of accepting the kingdom of god as a small child accepts it as an habituated state, a way of being in the world, and of being someone in whose presence others are able to catch glimpses of this childlike acceptance, that they might find it and deepen it in their life and pass it on to others. So that's my meditation reflection on childlike acceptance. Thank you so much, Jim. And uh, we thought we might just do a brief 
sit, uh, to just let that talk settle in. And uh, so I'm going to ring the bell and we'll sit together for just a minute or so. Wow, Jim, that talk was beautiful. Thank you for preparing it so carefully for us today. It was a very full talk. <laughs> it was funny when you, um, there was a moment when you uh, talked about the crying and the laughing. I was crying yeah. when you said that, and then I started laughing because <laughs> you no. caught me crying. <laughs> no. No. But yeah. No. So now we're going to turn to our audience and um, have some questions. And just to, a reminder to everyone who's here that you can click on the Q&A button to write your questions or uh, review some of the other questions and vote them up um, to, be, to be asked today. So our first question is coming from Ryan Austin. So welcome, Ryan. Hi. Hi, hi. So my, my question is, yeah, I've I've been listening very consistently for I don't know probably eighteen months or so, um, and just over time as I continue to listen, um, I just find that the answers that I I used to have um, my more private answers to questions about um, you know pain suffering the evil that we see in the world and you know the the responses that i was taught about those things um and and the problems with with the answers that i've been taught you know if god's all all powerful if he's all seeing you and he's all loving and yet here we are in the midst of all this pain and suffering i don't know i just never really felt like there were satisfying answers to those things but just unexplainably as, as I've spent time just listening and learning about this different way of seeing things, um, I feel like those concerns kind of melt away, thinking of God not just as this agent of good or enforcing things in the world, but that he's, <laughs> it's, it's so much more elemental than that. Um, you know, God as the ground of being, and you know what you you said something earlier that really struck me. Um, he's the infinite, you know, of life and the infinite of death. And there's something, yeah. I don't know. It's like I want to be a comfort to people. So I was I was just wondering, you know, how how do you Think about those things what kind of responses there for to offer yes here's my sense of it i'm going to say this now as a therapist who works with trauma and but also with my 
daughters and people and myself, my wife and I went together and we choose living, is, is this. What I try to do, if, say in, in therapy, for example, someone comes and sits down and they come in because they're suffering. And they start sharing their story with me. So my sense to be true to what I'm saying here is I try to join them and be one with them in a kind of empathy with their experience. And I try to meet them there so they sense that they're not alone. Thomas Merton once said, with spiritual things, to understand means to realize that you're infinitely understood. And I, and I walk with them through their journey, however that goes. And what happens on this journey is the initial way they were looking at it and the intensity of it. As it starts unfolding and opening up, they start dropping down into broader, more interior ways to contextualize this. And if they're also one of spiritual resource in this, they start dropping down into kind of a boundaryless state of being sustained by the presence of God that led them through their healing journey. So their own healing journey, God, somehow the infinity of the very journey of their healing. This is true of Alcoholics Anonymous, too. You know, the journey, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of following these steps. See? And uh, so I think that's what matters, is we join ourselves where we are, and we look back over our shoulder and see that it wasn't maybe all that long ago we weren't capable of seeing things in this more spacious way which means we're in the midst of a journey that we're already on this path. And we live it, and then we try to meet each person where they are, be present to them. So I think it's along things like that. It's a total paradigm shift. It, it really is. See, because if we, if someone is suffering and they're not at this space yet, we're actually dishonoring them by giving them a little sermonette. You know, thing is you don't, Unfortunately, you're not as profound as I am. I'd like to help you out. <laughs> they're going, oh, really? <laughs> Give me a break. But if instead we're just two human beings together, and let me join you where you are, and the very stance of my openness of being with you might help you to have a little broader base to your dilemma. And I think that's the feeling of relating to people this way, to ourselves. Anyway. Thank you, though, for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, just to add to that, I um, loved the way you taught that practice today, this practice of childlike acceptance. And um, I, I feel like we can sit with others the way you were teaching us to sit with ourselves. Exactly. To, to be present to what's arising from them and sit, just sitting with it and, and accepting it. Exactly. That's why I say what I added. It means accepting the extent to which you're unable to do this because God does. And so what I always thought of psychotherapy is psychotherapy is meditation for two. Mm. You're sitting together. Likewise, any intimate exchange between lovers, spouse, father, mother, sister, any friend, any intimate exchange is the sharing of this. Like you meet each other in this uh, space, you know, in this, uh, which is God, actually. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And then you just need to be aware as an adult if the person is doing things that aren't that that wise as a serpent piece. You you don't accept if the behavior towards you is um, it, it, is exactly. unhealthy. Yeah. But you can join them in their suffering and and, and be a part of their yeah yeah. This yeah. non dual consciousness is not dualistically other than dualistically consciousness. It's the ground of it. Mm -hmm. So all those levels are still true. So when someone's saying something, you might say to them, you know, I'm concerned about you. Really, well, you know what? I, I don't. Uh, that tone you're using with me is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to share with me something, I'm welcome to it. But I, I, I'm asking you not to do that. And sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves that way, also. So all that is still there. Yes. But it has this quality where the depth dimension is illuminating the horizontal dimension mm -hmm. of our health and our relationships and our work, and and it's all woven together. That's really helpful. Ryan, thank you so much for that question. And uh, now we're going to welcome Don. Is it Mariska? Don Mariska? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Lovely Hi. to see you. Mm. Hi, Don. Hi. What a, what a privilege to be with you here today. Um, I've been listening to the Turning to the Mystics podcasts from the very start. And I've always been intrigued by the idea of how we can each be 
have that kind of mystical experience ourselves. And I'm feeling like these conversations are really helping me to get there. So, and I love looking at where you're living. Uh, I, I just have this fantasy of being there with you and having you tell me about all those little things that you treasure in your bookcases behind you and everything else. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, so it is very special to have this opportunity. Thanks for making it available. Um, I'm, I'm always uh, struck, I, I get drawn in by these conversations and I feel the immediacy and the presence of, of God. And then I look at and experience the chaotic and brutal world that I'm in. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, I, then I feel like I sort of fall off the wagon, if you will. And I really appreciate what you offered towards the end of your uh, meditation with us uh, about some ways to keep that true. I, I, I loved your discussion about the, about the person in the lake, you know, and, and uh, floating there. I guess I'm sort of thinking, oh my gosh, if I were in that case, I'd probably flail away <laughs> and lose all my energy and drown before they ever came back for me. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious, um, how to more fully hold on to that that lifeline, if you will, as, as I go through life. Uh, I've been following the meditations. I do the journaling each day. I try to do those things. And yet there still is this pull on me that, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure about this. Can I really trust this? Yes. You know, a few thoughts. Very good. I'll resp respond. Is, you know, something that helps me with this is that sometimes when we hear this kind of talk and we feel the loftiness of it and the grace of being drawn towards it, you know, is that I, I think it isn't that it isn't lofty. I mean, it's eternal. It's infinite. It goes on forever. But really what's surprising about it is it's a matter of calibrating our heart to a finer, finer scale. Uh, where we begin to pick up that it's already happening. Or imagine you have a radio and you turn it on, you just hear static. There's a dial to heighten the receptive power of the radio. As you heighten this receptive, music starts coming through. And so what meditation practice does is like that dial on the radio. It, it causes it's something like gazing at the palms of your own hands or the bird descending or slant a light across the floor. You know what I mean? The darkness of the room. It's like, it's like dropping down into this. Then when that moment of, when that happens, then you ask for the grace as you go through the day, not to break the thread of that awareness. But it breaks many times. It makes, it makes many times. See? And, uh, but little by little with practice, with practice. Because look, for example, right now, you've been listening to the podcast and you're with us now. Something's happening. I just, you know what I mean? Seriously, and the sincerity of your question shows that something's happening. And so I think for a long time, it's so that which is essential never imposes itself. That which is unessential is constantly imposing itself. That's what it's like. But by a higher order imperative of our awakened heart, we can keep staying in that which is ever so subtle and delicate. And little by little by little, we start seeing little moments where it shows up throughout the day. You know, we catch little glimpses of it in moments with people or seeing things. And as it keeps going, like connecting the dots, little by little, we realize we're on this arc. It's, you know, it's the path like that. And it's like walking that and being open to it and leaning in deeper, you know, because God's not finished with you yet. You know, we're not... We haven't passed through the veil yet. It's a, we're on this learning curve. And uh, and here we are. It's, it's the grace of being together like this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the gifts that you are, Jim and, and Kirsten and Corey and all of you at CAC to my life. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much, Don. I always, in those moments where I start like where did it go what if what, why can't i i uh i always hear jim's voice saying and god loves me right there in that spot as well and uh to remember that i'm loved even in the doubt and the wishing it was different and the um i find that helpful yeah, yeah and pick up too something i find helpful it's realizing 
is saying to God in a sense like, yes, it does come and go because I get caught up. In... But then I say to God, you're the infinity of my inability to realize this because you love me so in my mm. inability. And so there's a kind of constancy that sustains us in our inconsistencies. Because otherwise, say, am I holy yet? Am I holy yet? Do you think I'll make it? Whereas really, where faith is not on our ability to live in fidelity to it, we put our faith in God's love who sustains us in our inabilities to live up to it, which I, I think is the gift of tears or experiential salvation. It's grace, really. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, so I think Mary is next. Is that right, Corey? Yeah, um, Mary asked a question uh, about the about hope and anticipation. But Mary, if you could raise your hand, because there's so many Marys, I don't know how to find which one you are in the crowd. So if you could just raise your hand, we'll bring you on. But for now, Kirsten, we have a question from an anonymous uh, attendee. Could you just read that one and then while we wait for Mary? Yes, wonderful. So Jim, the question is, can you speak to how childlike acceptance can help us move through grief? Yes. And I want to put the intensity of grief as trauma, working with trauma with grief. It is uh, some things to consider, starting at the psychological level first, is uh, we start by accepting that, that uh, we're in grief because we've suffered some immense loss, you know, some invasive injustice. Some, and the first thing is accepting that it's happened. Next, we also accept right now that we're flooded or we're overwhelmed, like beside, we accept that. See? Next, and, and let's just say there's different kinds of grief. Let's say the death of a loved one, just, you know, just to make it more specific. Then in the, death of the, in the death of the loved one, the importance of grieving, because unprocessed grieving turns into depression. See? Mm. And be, grieving has a beginning, a middle, and an end. In the very beginning, it's terrible. You know, there are no words for that feeling. But then as the arc stabilizes, you start to get your bearings in your grief. And you start integrating the grief into life, because you know the deceased loved one would want you to do that. Then if you're a person of faith, you know that the deceased loved one isn't, didn't go anywhere when they died. And their deathless presence is unexplainably one with you. And then you can start to realize that uh, in your love for the deceased loved one, it isn't that you did love them, you still do. Mm. And you believe that they still love you. And so the way of the widower is the veil then between life and death becomes more and more diaphanous, more translucent. And it turns into kind of, it's always sad, but it's a kind of a gentle sadness. It has a certain sweetness about it, you know, like a depth or a melancholy about life. And it also helps us to realize with the deceased person is not to get too upset because you're next. Very soon you're going to be, before we get too upset, you know, we're looking, we're not stuck here. You know what I mean? About three and a half seconds, we'll be dead in a million years. And so, so that phase of grieving is a very important part of the journey. It's a very, very important part of this, the mysterious oneness of the painful absence of the beloved. And what does that mean? And how do we accept that? Mm -hmm. Which are the wisdom of it? And know that we're united with people all over the world that are grieving that. Mm -hmm. And so I would say connections like this can be helpful. Yeah, that's yeah. really helpful, Jim. And sometimes to reach, um, to go through that beginning, middle and end, you might need external support too, it, not just it, the internal. It, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you have a support system that you're not alone in it. You can because mm -hmm. that's the terrible part about being alone. See, that's what we're we're so intensely in pain because the beloved isn't with us the way they used to be. You start looking around and there's no one around. But if there's someone there who's with you in it. And this is where sometimes with professional help, especially if there's a propensity inside toward depression mm -hmm. or panic or past trauma, it can reactivate all of that. So sometimes a professional like grieving work or therapy, if needed, yeah. is also support. And also taking care of yourself physically and the simple rituals of life, staying in stated 
in that. And then bringing your grief to prayer, sitting with it in your grief. And God doesn't take the grief away, but over time, in the presence of God, you can see uh, you know, God's with us in that grief. It has its own mystery to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, you're, um, you're not next. <laughs> We're hoping you'll be here for, for a long time. Oh, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll see what God has in mind. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, Mary, welcome. Hello. Good afternoon. Good to Hi. see you. It's Hi, good Mary. to see you. Hi. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity today. It's uh, really special. I, too, have been listening uh, to Turning to the Mystics for about since like this time last year. So it's amazing to be present with both of you. And uh, thank you. So my question was, um, during this time of hope and anticipation of Advent, what words could you offer to those of us with wounded relationships with our families? Yes. You know, uh, the, 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 the timing of childlike acceptance with Advent is that um, God, God's response to us in our dilemma of our suffering is to become one with us as precious in our dilemma. That's the thing. And uh, Jesus was born a child through, man, through his life. And in his daily life, he would spend whole nights in prayer, this oneness coming out. He who sees me sees the Father. And he went looking for suffering. He went looking for suffering to set people free from suffering. And if you look at the miracle stories in the Gospels, I can't see, I can't walk, I'm a prostitute, I have leprosy, I have, I think my daughter died, and so on. Jesus always acknowledges the suffering. He meets them and he responds to it. And so we know that sometimes, this happens a lot in families where there's been trauma or discord and people don't talk and, and it's going on in my family, see. And this can be disheartening. But the, the thing is, is that <clears throat> in Jesus, in, in meeting Jesus in the healing encounter poetically, is you see reflected in Jesus' eyes, who Jesus knows you to be before the origins of the universe. Jesus sees that the root of your pain isn't the suffering that your family's fragmented or that you're blind or can't see. Jesus sees that the trouble is you think you are what's wrong with you. You, you think you are. This family dilemma has to say in who you are. <clears throat> like you can't see past it. And that's why it really gets to us. We can, we can uh, endure anything provided the center holds. When it gets so invasive, like deep, meaningful relationships that are lost, and we don't know how to approach it. So what childlike acceptance can do in prayer is the acceptance of that situation and being present in God who infinitely accepts you as infinitely lovable in your situation. And to know that God's presence is one with you in the midst of a broken world, in microcosm, your broken family. And you stay open. It means from your end, you would welcome that. And you see, you, you see to it that you've done everything you can do. Like uh, when and if you're ready, I would love if this could happen. But in the meantime, if not, maybe not. You know, such is life. And I move on. And so I, I, I think it's things like that. It's things like that. It's a very deep question. It's a therapy question, a spiritual direction question of how to not romanticize or minimalize how hurtful it is. But at the same time, to think the taproot of our heart in God's unbroken oneness with us that isn't diminished or threatened by the brokenness of our family relationships. And we can be present to the brokenness in the midst of being present to the brokenness in a grounded way like this. And you would hope down. Who knows what could happen? Sometimes these things get resolved. They do often. Things mellow over time. And then sometimes they don't. And uh, you just like walk the walk. You know? yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Like, it's um, hard. Yeah, it's John, hard. Uh, you've mentioned the Johnny Cash song before. Yes. <laughs> I walk yeah. the line. 
<laughs> yeah, I walked the line. Because of you, I walked the line. <clears throat> exactly. It'd be a good way to put this, Johnny. I heard a lovely interview <coughs> with Krista Tippett on being, interviewing Johnny Cash's daughter, who's also a singer. And she spoke of her father as a mystic. I think he was a mystic. Mm -hmm. That Appalachian, uh, earthy core kind of wailing, you know, this deep kind of cry that has presence in it mm -hmm. because of you. And so in a way, he's talking to his beloved, you know, it's so easy to be true. But really, he's, he's echoing, he's saying it to God. See, because of you, I walk the line. See, it's so easy to be true. Yeah, it's okay. good. Thank you, guys. Johnny Mary, Kay. thank you for your question. I'm sure there's many people on this call today feeling one with you in that. Yeah, exactly. At this, so I hope you'll take some comfort. Um, I know from myself too, I have estranged um, very um, important family members. And so I, I feel one with you in your question Me. and your suffering. And um, Me too. Grateful yeah. that you brought it up. So yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. Mary. Bye-bye. So thank you, Irene, for this question. And how do you get quiet enough to be still, still in the sense of your life to get grounded? I find I move a lot. Yes. You know, I would say, first of all, your you know, grace builds on nature thing. It's a sense as if some people find it hard to sit still. And therefore, like walking meditation, mm. or even a long, slow walk, like a meditative walk, you know, or walking around your own house to be in motion. And um, and so sometimes that helps people do that because to sit still very long, it gets different things start coming up for them. The other way is to sit still, but be kind of present in a very still way to the to your rushing mind. And you might even say to your rushing mind, if it rushes, you know, where do you think you're going? Like this, and to kind of um, follow your rushing mind to see where it goes, mm. and to love your rushing mind and see where it's headed, because is it is it running from something or towards something? Is there an underlying kind of hypomanic kind of anxiety you need to look at? It could be phys physiological, or medical, psychiatric, kind of an agitated uh, idle of your engine set too high. Or is there some unresolved trauma, something you're anxious about? And then bring it to God in prayer and sit with it, talk to people, and kind of you know see where that goes. I was struck by Thomas Merton. He was so bound with energy. That's why he kept writing all these books, that he had all this amazing energy, hundreds and hundreds of letters. But he was so grounded in the energy of his mind. You know what I mean? It was like, a, like the still point of the turning world. He found the axis out of which to be present to the unfolding of it. And so, um, yeah, it, we all need to, we, it's personal, it's universally personal. And we need to do this in a way that is given to us to do it. Because mm -hmm. that's where grace works when we go with how it's given to us to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Jim. That's that's really helpful uh, because and life is fast too for many of us like the the pace we have to keep up because of our jobs or our roles or um, life life has a pace so yeah I want to say something about that you know in a way it does that's why you get this feeling we're carried along by the momentum of the day yes and we feel we're skimming across the surface of the depth of our own life yes you know. And what's tragic is God's oneness with us is hidden in that depth. Mm -hmm. See? So how do I slow down enough and drop into that and little by little keep that depth dimension through the harried day? Yes. See? But in another way of looking at it also is life is glacial and is infinitely slow. The universe is ancient see? and we're woven into it like this. And so another way of look, another way of looking at it, you know, too soon old, too late smart, is the, uh, you know, our full enlightenment is slow in coming. <laughs> and, <laughs> it isn't like, uh, you know, mystical union by Thursday. And uh, so it's it's a mixture of slow and fast and being present to that. Yeah. Yes, yes, 
I've got mine on the calendar for December 31. There you go. Do you think I'm going to make it? Good luck with that. <laughs> um, well, Jim, this time's gone, speaking of fast, this time yeah. has gone fast with our audience here and what a gift um, to have contact in this way with everyone and to feel their presence with us today.